Good evening, I'd like to welcome everyone to the College of Complexes. My name is Stu McKenna, I'm serving as uh, not the moderator, but until Brahms done collecting money. We have three things we do here at the college. First, we have a brief announcements period. Second, we have our speaker who presents. Then we have the question and answer period. We ask that you put things in the form of a question and not just a statement because the third part of the show is our infamous rebuttal period where you get a certain designated amount of time to speak your mind whether it be on topic or off. All right, let's welcome our speaker. All right, my name is Dan Bader. I work for the City of Chicago Department of Public Health at one of the community mental health centers, North River. Uh, but I'm not representing the City of Chicago or the Department of Public Health uh, or the mental health center. I'm representing myself. Uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, about what I call the three building blocks of mental health, no. which are uh, some things that, if they can be understood and applied, it should in inoculate most people against mental health problems. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start with talking about, let me see if I can get this up here. Okay, so one of the things is a psychiatric diagnosis. Everybody's familiar with these diagnoses. They come out with this big book called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It's put out by the American Psychiatric Society, uh, Association. Now, uh, that particular uh, way of looking at mental illness, mental health, uh, assumes that there's a chemical imbalance uh, and that that can be corrected primarily by medication. Therapy could be something which is adjunctive uh, to it. Uh, now a better way to understand most mental health disorders is a combination of an individual's coping skills, their state of physical health, uh, and the socioeconomic health of a community. And I think that will be pretty clear as we go on. Now, in order to talk about the chemical imbalance theory of mental health, which usually is some version of you have a uh, imbalance of your neurotransmitters, usually serotonin or dopamine. Um, I'm going to talk about what I call the vervet monkey paradigm. Uh, it's kind of a thought experiment based on actual research that was done in the 1990s, shortly after the first uh, SSRI antidepressant Prozac came online. And you know, the idea of Prozac or these other antidepressants is to increase the quantity or the speed of transmission of the neurotransmitter called uh, serotonin. So here's the Vervet monkey uh, experiment. How do you spell that, Vervet? Uh, Vervet, V-E-R-V-E-T. It's uh, the kind of monkey they use for these experiments. So what we're going to do is we're going to take five male vervet monkeys and we're going to put them in an enclosure. It's only going to take a matter of days, maybe a little bit longer, and they're going to sort themselves out into a strict pecking order. One, two, three, four, five. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to measure the serotonin metabolite of these monkeys and see if there's a difference in terms of how much serotonin they have in their system according to where they are in the hierarchy. And what we're going to find is that monkey number one, the alpha monkey, has 50% more serotonin metabolite than any of the others. And as you go down the hierarchy, uh, it gets worse and worse. Now, you have to understand that monkey number five, the omega monkey, has a horrible existence. 
because what happens is every time monkey number one makes a move against any of the other monkeys, they are going to go and redirect that aggression at the monkeys that are lower down on the hierarchy. Number five, the Omega monkey, will never escape an assault. It has no one else it can redirect its own anger or aggression against. So monkey number five is going to be in a horrible shape. If we were giving out diagnoses, we'd say it's PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, and probably some psychosis if we could determine that. This monkey is going to be uh, a, in, in a nightmare of emotional pain. So we see that serotonin is a neurotransmitter that is associated with, if you are at the top of the hierarchy, you're going to feel very, very good. And your ability to feel okay is going to get worse as you go down uh, the hierarchy. Uh, the second part of what we're going to now do is we're going to take five groups of monkeys and we're going to let them, male monkeys, we're going to let them sort themselves out. One, two, three, four, five. We now have five groups. Then we're going to take the number one monkey in each of those groups, the alpha monkey, and we're going to put them in a group for themselves. Well, they're going to sort themselves out just like any other group of five monkeys. But now what's going to happen is a monkey who used to be in very good shape, high level of serotonin, is now going to be the number five monkey and is going to have some pretty severe mental health problems uh, there. So you can go from number one being in good shape down to being a mental health wreck very easily by just shifting where you are in the hierarchy. And of course we can do the same thing with the number five monkeys. If we take five number five monkeys, throw them into a group, now one of those monkeys which had horrible mental health is not going to be in good shape. They're going to have a very high level of serotonin because now their situation has changed. And I think that paradigm uh, uh, the, the understanding that where you are in a given hierarchy, interpersonal hierarchy, maybe where you are in a societal hierarchy, is going to make a difference. And the final part of this is this. If we take a number one monkey, put it behind a one-way mirror, and then we throw the other four on the other side, now that monkey the number one can see the others. It will continue to make uh, kind of dominance moves. You know, it'll try to scare the other monkeys. And it wants to see them move away or give an appeasement signal. But of course, the other four monkeys can't see uh, the number one. And so what will happen is after a while, the uh, serotonin level in the number one monkey behind the one-way mirror is going to go down. Because in order to keep that serotonin level up, it needs to see the submissive appeasement gestures on the part of the other monkeys. It's very reinforcing. Okay, so when, we, when you think about mental health, uh, again, uh, our ability as human beings, we're not monkeys, but I think everybody knows how these hierarchies work, whether you're in a workplace, whether you're a kid in the playground, whatever. It's a very big part of life. Uh, so uh, the biochemical uh, imbalance depends in large part on the environmental circumstances that you find yourself in. All right, I'm going to skip this uh, part on uh, diagnosis. Uh, there's not time for that, but those of you who have a copy of this can, uh, uh, can look at it. Okay. Uh, I see this. Not used to these clickers. Okay. Now we're at the three building blocks of mental health. And I'm going to, uh, you know, go through this. 
we have emotion management, we have boundary setting, which I'll talk about and define, and we have what I call the satisfaction of needs. As human beings, we have certain needs that we're hardwired uh, to have addressed and taken care of. And if they are not, we're going to get a lot of uh, emotional pain. Okay. Uh, so the three building blocks uh, of mental health represent knowledge and skill sets uh, that can uh, lead to the removal of significant roadblocks uh, to the achievement and maintenance of mental health. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be. All right, so I'm just going to go uh, quickly to uh, the emotions are the first building block. We have anger, sadness, anxiety, interest, excitement, and shame. Now, you can, have, you know, people can break down emotions into 8, 16, depending on, you know, context, circumstances, but these five, anger, sadness, anxiety, interest, excitement, and shame, cover it pretty well. Uh, so we're going to begin with uh, the anger, which is one of the most important, and I say these five key emotions need to be effectively managed in order to obtain and maintain good mental health. All right, so we have anger. This diagram, at the top of the diagram, we have the five things that naturally stimulate anger. I think we all understand this. Uh, frustration. Uh, if I'm trying to get here and there's a lot of traffic, I'm going to be frustrated and feel some anger. Uh, physical discomfort. If I didn't get enough sleep last night or I have chronic pain in my knee or back, I'm going to get some irritability, anger worked up. Uh, disrespect. When we get disrespected, and I'm going to define that in a minute, uh, we get angry. Unfairness. When we feel we have been treated unfairly, we get angry, and when we suffer losses, we get angry. And of course, we can have combinations. Now, anger and all of the emotions are hardwired instinctual entities, and they have an action that they are trying to release. In the case of anger, it is attack aggression. And that can be physical or it can be with verbal also. Now, when we get angry, gets triggered, we get thoughts which facilitate the action. Yes. One of the thoughts is that whoever it is that I'm angry at, or whatever it is I'm angry at, uh, is kind of all bad, deserving of revenge, retribution, punishment. And I lose my fear of consequences. I lose my anxiety, my shame, guilt, when anger is taking over. That is to facilitate my ability to attack without fear of consequences or guilt about what it is I'm doing. So this is the nature of the emotion. All right, now we have three disrespectful expressions of anger, and this is kind of a definition of what we would call disrespect. And everybody, uh, if you want to have good mental health, you have to, you don't have to use this map, you know, what I'm calling disrespectful, you can make your own. But you need to be able to distinguish between disrespectful anger and respectful anger. So I list here violence, threats of violence or abandonment, and attacking a person's identity. Now, uh, you know, violence is violence. You get angry, you go ahead and you hit somebody, or you throw something at them. You hurt them. Uh, uh, threats of violence, you know, we all know about those. You know, if you don't shut up, I'm going to do this. Uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we can also have what I would call a nonverbal threat of violence, and we need to be aware of this. So if I'm angry at somebody, and I don't actually say I'm going to hurt them, but they see me yelling at the top of my lungs or slamming my arm down on the surface, they're going to understand that I'm threatening them, that if they don't do what it is I want or stop what they're doing, I'm going to launch an assault. 
Uh, so we have to be aware of these kind of nonverbal threats of violence. Threats of abandonment. What I mean by that is you're angry at somebody. Say you're in a relationship, it's a family, or whatever it is. And you basically threaten to completely cut off relations with them. Now you may, you know, there may be difficulties between people, and it may be that down the road, say, you have to separate, but you do not want to do that when they are dependent on you, they are attached to you, etc. So we're going to say, in this uh, definition, that's disrespectful. Now attacking a person's identity, these are qualities, characteristics that we have that we can't really change that easily, you know, like uh, our identity as a man or a woman, so if you're angry at somebody, don't use the B word, this kind of thing. Uh, uh, you know, give them respect concerning their gender. Uh, you know, race, uh, ethnicity, intelligence, appearance, don't go there. Now, you know when you're angry, you always want to go there a lot because you know that's going to hurt the person's feelings. So that's what I'm meaning by uh, disrespectful forms of anger. We don't want to do that. Uh, okay. Now, a respectful expression of anger addresses the frustration, disrespect, or unfairness that has triggered the anger. You know, uh, you know when you, you know, when you yell at the top of your lungs, I feel disrespected. The next time you're upset with me, please don't yell. I mean, that's just asking, you know, the person, you're not saying you can't get upset with me, but please don't yell or don't threaten or don't hit or whatever it is that is the issue. Okay. Well, you're not giving the pleasure to change the book. Now, um, give the word. Okay. Now, an emotion timeout, we've all heard of, you know, anger timeouts, you know, you walk around the block or something. Uh, uh, and you know, time, you don't really have to do a formal timeout, but you need to give yourself the time and space to allow the bodily manifestation of the anger, which is mostly adrenaline. Excuse me. Uh, Excuse me. And you want to be able to let that come down. As the adrenaline level comes down, you must counter those automatic thoughts that the emotion generates, which is whoever it is you're upset with is essentially bad and deserving of retribution, punishment, and you don't have any fear. You know, like how many times when you're angry or when people are angry, they say things like, you know, I don't call if you care if you call the police. I don't care what you do. I'm going to teach you a lesson. You're not going to get away with this. You know, so we have to remind ourselves most of the people we get angry at are not all bad. They may have been there helping us last week and we're mad at them now, you know, for one reason or another. We also have to run down the consequences. If every time I get frustrated, disrespected, or treated unfairly, I throw a temper tantrum, I'm going to have a lot of mental health problems because that's going to happen a lot in the everyday course of life. And what's going to happen is people are not going to want to spend much time with me. You know, he's got a short fuse, you never know when he's going to go off, he's a jerk, etc. So uh, we, we want to remind ourselves of the consequences. If I shoot him, I'm going to probably ruin my life and, you know, uh, it may be a family member. People do all sorts of things when they are enraged that, that are uh, very consequential. Okay, motion number two is sadness. Same way with anger. What's, what triggers at the top of the page? It's losses. Now, there's a lot of different types of losses. Uh, you know, we can lose a job, we can lose a loved one, they die, somebody, you know, relationship breaks up, we get defeated, uh, you know, there's all sorts of losses. This triggers the emotion of sadness. Now, sadness is the emotion we have to get us to accept a permanent loss. You know, a death is a permanent loss, at least in this world, you know. So, if somebody dies, sadness wants us to feel hopeless and helpless concerning the regaining of whatever it is that's lost. Now, just like anger and all the emotions, they are, they are wrong a good percentage of the time. 
You know, I can be angry at somebody and, and uh, you know, think they're the worst person in the world when I'm feeling angry. Uh, and that's not correct. That's just wrong. Sadness has the same kind of uh, a quality. It's very easy to feel hopeless and helpless about temporary losses and things which are not losses at all. Now, with depression, any kind of, you know, major depression, usually one of the features is a person has come to a conclusion that their future is a permanent loss. You know, they have no future, even though logically uh, the future hasn't uh, unfolded yet. It could be bad, it could be good, depending on what you do or don't do in the present. So that's sadness. Now let me move on here. Okay, so this is just saying it's the emotion we experience due to a loss urges us to reflexively view losses as permanent. If I lose my job at the mental health center, all right, you know, Mayor Emanuel shuts them all down. Well, that will be probably a permanent loss. I can't work there any longer. But that doesn't mean that a job itself is a permanent loss. I may be able to get another job. If I lose, you know, if somebody gets divorced, that relationship with that individual may now, or at least the intimate part of it, may be a permanent loss. But you can have another relationship theoretically. So we have to be able to differentiate these things. Uh, sadness urges you to reflexively assume that any loss is pretty much on the permanent end of things. It also makes us feel depleted. Anger makes us feel energized because it wants us to attack to fight. Sadness wants us to throw in the towel, to accept it, don't waste your energy on a permanent loss, and therefore it depletes us of energy. It wants us to give up in order to go forward. If a loss is permanent, it is necessary to accept it and conserve our very finite supply of emotional energy. Uh, our energy is, needs to be devoted to the recovery of temporary losses or the pursuit of goals, which are not losses at all. And uh, again, if you would, if uh, one thing to mention here, when we make a decision to do something, or we crystallize a belief about something, that's a very, very consequential event because it's very hard to walk it back. Because you know, for example, somebody makes a decision or they crystallize the belief, you know, I have no future, and they cross over that line. Now what that means is they're going to have easy access to all of the information they have stored away which justifies that. You know, uh, I'm old, I'm sick, this happened, that happened. You'll have easy access to all of the information or evidence which will lead, to, which will support your future is hopeless. You will not have easy access to the color evidence. And if somebody says to you, you know, uh, hey, uh, the future hasn't unfolded, this could happen, you will tend to minimize that or rationalize that away. If I'm the therapist and I say that to somebody, they're just going to, they may rationalize it, say, oh, you know, you're the therapist, that's what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to give us hope, but, you know, that's all that is. So we, we want to be aware with all of the emotions. Try not to crystallize beliefs or make decisions when you're in a very emotional state. You want to let yourself come down, whatever the emotion is, before the belief or the decision gets made. I mean, think of a religious belief, you know, a faith. Uh, a lot of times, when we're kids, we get a lot of things put into us, and we just accept it as a belief is true. But, but I mean, you know, think about how hard it is to walk back some belief that you have already crystallized. It's not easy. And so you want to be very, very careful about when you're in a high emotional state, making a decision or, you know, like I'm going to kill myself because my future is hopeless. Uh, you want to let yourself come down from that emotional state. Okay. All right, so sadness time out. Uh, we need to determine if the loss we are responding to is permanent, temporary, or a future goal that has been mistakenly identified as a permanent loss. 
just like with anger. If uh, uh, my boss gave me a hard time at work, and I'm walking down the street feeling really upset, really angry over the disrespect or the unfairness I perceived I was receiving, I may go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, take it out on an innocent person. Just like those monkeys in the vervet monkey enclosure. You know, one mon the big monkey, the number one monkey attacks them, they redirect it elsewhere. Uh, uh, so we want to be aware that these emotions, uh, uh, we have to be very aware as to how they motivate us and push us. All right, I've already, you know, a relationship breakup, job loss, and a depressive conclusion that the future is hopeless. I went over those. All right, emotion number three is anxiety. Uh, just like the other emotions, it's triggered by a future threat. And every future threat you can think of, you can reduce it down to some emotional pain, I don't want to feel that way, or some physical pain, I don't want to experience that, or some combination. So when we have a future threat, we get anxiety. Now, anxiety, the action that anxiety is wanting is for us to avoid or escape the threat. And it gives us thoughts to facilitate that action. We get catastrophic thoughts, you know, oh my God, this is a nightmare. It, it, it's horrible. Uh, I'm going to die of cancer, even though I haven't been diagnosed with it yet. Uh, uh, it also gives us inefficacy thoughts, meaning thoughts that I can't take it. It's way too much for me. I can't go through that again. I don't even want to think about it. That's what anxiety gives us because it wants us to escape or avoid something. Okay. So, all right. um, it wants us essentially to err on the side of safety. Anger wants us to attack. Sadness wants us to throw in the towel, accept a permanent loss. Anxiety wants us to escape or avoid a threat. Uh, that's when we decide to avoid a threat, we usually experience immediate relief. Likewise with anger, go ahead and have a temper tantrum. You'll feel better for a moment. You know when when it's actually being uh, uh, when it's in play. Um, all right. So with anxiety, now this is a little more complex, but not that difficult. So what I'm going to just step over here to kind of look at this. Uh, all right. So what we do is we have to ask whether the threat is avoidable or not. This is a key thing. If the answer is yes, we can then avoid it. But our avoidance may be adaptive. It was a good avoidance. Uh, if I don't have to be in a dangerous neighborhood at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, and I'm thinking about going here for some reason, it's triggered off in my head. I don't need to do that. I can stay away from that. I can avoid a lot of things and I'm going to be better off for having done so. But a lot of times I'm going to avoid things that I really should take care of. Uh, I may decide, I may, you know, maybe I have a job interview and I'm thinking, you know, if I go there I'm going to get rejected and humiliated. I mean, it's happened before. But the problem is I need a job and I have to go for that interview. And uh, if I end up avoiding it because the anxiety is telling me it's going to be a catastrophe, a nightmare, and I'm not up for that, I can't handle that emotional pain, then I don't get a job and I'm going to have emotional pain uh, because I don't have uh, financial stability. So we have to look at uh, the avoidance when we can do it and decide whether it's adaptive or maladaptive. Now, when we have no ability to avoid something, when it's not an option. Now that can be, you know, for example, if I, I don't know, I've had gastrointestinal symptoms for a couple of weeks and they don't go away. I'm probably going to have an anxiety fantasy that I have cancer. Now, the reality is, uh, if I have cancer, I have nowhere to run from it. It's there. I haven't had it diagnosed. I might not have it 
but I have no place to run, no place to hide. I can't get away. When it's that kind of a situation, when you cannot escape or avoid, uh, you have to tell yourself that you can take the pain, the emotional pain. You can take the shame. You can take uh, uh, the sadness. You can handle whatever the emotional pain is or the physical pain. Because if you don't, if you do not tell yourself that you in fact can take it, you're going to start to have a minor breakdown, which can be physical or emotional. Think of it, you know, in, in a certain kind of a way. Um, again, if I have to go for a job interview, I've said to myself, I have to go. Avoidance is not an option for me. i got to go there. But I'm telling myself, oh my God, I can't take, I just can't handle another humiliation. I can't handle another rejection. Uh, but i got to go. As I start to go, I'm likely to have all sorts of physical symptoms. Maybe I'll have a panic attack. Maybe I'll feel, uh, I'll have diarrhea. I'll have a bad headache. Or maybe I'll just simply, if I have a vulnerability, slip into a minor depressive state and kind of throw in the towel on it. So when we cannot exercise avoidance, we need to be able to tell ourselves that we can cope uh, with the pain. <laughs> All right, this is emotion number four. It's interest slash excitement. Um, I just kind of put this there. It's not one that's usually talked about uh, with these other negative emotions. Interest represents a low level of the feeling, like maybe what I'm saying is of interest to you. You're watching a TV show. Uh, uh, something is of interest, you're reading a book. That's interest. Excitement is you're really enthusiastic, really highly motivated. Now, what interest, excitement, emotion is sometimes referred to as the seeking system. It's considered to be an important biological uh, system which allows us to be motivated and to take care of our needs. So, at the top of the diagram, we have goals, novelty, and drive states. All of these will recruit or bring on the emotion of interest excitement. Now, the drives include hunger, thirst, sex, affection, uh, intimacy, and all the acquired addictions, whether it's alcohol, drugs, gambling, whatever. Uh, uh, these things will then recruit the emotion of interest excitement. And interest excitement kind of the flip of anger. Anger makes whatever it is we're focused on seem all bad. Uh, interest excitement makes it be, uh, seem all good, all important, or all necessary. A lot of times addictions kind of unfold in that way, you know. When you first take the drug, it feels really good. Uh, and then after a while, it becomes necessary. Uh, and just like anger, interest excitement causes us to have a disregard for negative consequences. It takes away, just like anger, uh, anxiety and shame. You know, it, we sometimes call it the Nike emotion. Just do it. it it's very motivational. Uh, so we, we have to understand that it wants us to acquire something, explore something, get something, uh, uh, do something. Now, uh, just, you know, think of somebody who uh, tends to have kind of a hypomanic personality. Uh, you know, where their baseline mood is very up, they're very extroverted, they tend to have a lot of interest, excitement, emotion going. That can get a person in a lot of trouble. Clearly, uh, uh, if you uh, decide to take something that doesn't belong to you, uh, if you decide to buy things which you can't afford, uh, if you get yourself entangled in a relationship because you find somebody attractive but you're actually married and have children or something of this nature, interest excitement can cause a lot of trouble. Uh, just like anger can. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay.
So this is just, you know, down at the bottom, I'm again saying it, it generates thoughts which disregard or minimize the potential negative consequences that can follow interest, excitement, generated actions. So when you're in an interested, excited state or an angry state, look out. Um, and, you know, oftentimes people who get labeled as being, say, bipolar, um, you know, they, they may be in a very interested, excited state. And um, what happens is they may, you know, interest excitement, that high level of interest excitement takes away, if it's winning, uh, anxiety and shame guilt. But it doesn't take away anger. So uh, if the person who's in that very interested, excited, enthusiastic state trying to do something, make something happen, and they get frustrated, they can flip into an angry state very, very easily. And that happens a lot. All right, so the interest, excitement, timeout is just kind of like the anger timeout. Uh, take sufficient time for the anticipatory excitement, enthusiastic arousal to subside. Uh, while on the timeout, recalibrate the automatic thoughts. Whatever it is, it's not as good as it feels in the moment. Uh, and if you go ahead and do it or take it, uh, think of the consequences that may come your way. Let yourself come down. Do not make decisions if you can help it uh, when you're in a very, very emotionally aroused state. You're likely to make a bad call. Sometimes uh, it will be correct, uh, but most of the time it, it won't be. Okay. Final emotion here, we have uh, shame. Shame is uh, triggered by disrespect or the failure to meet standards, expectations that we have imprinted in our mind. Shame urges us to hide, um, and there's different ways of hiding. Uh, it gives us thoughts which facilitate the hiding. We're going to get abandonment ideation. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I'm inferior. Who would want to be with me? Or we get persecution, persecutory ideation. I'm inferior and I will be ridiculed, you know, teased, humiliated. Shame gives you those thoughts in order to encourage you to hide. Now, um, shame is the social conformity emotion. Every group has standards and expectations concerning behavior and responsibilities. Shame urges us to hide when we perceive we are unable to meet group standards and expectations. It facilitates the hiding process by automatically generating those thoughts. We have, we're going to look at anger, dishonesty, and withdrawal are three instinctive forms of hiding which are generally maladapted. So a lot of times, we can get angry at somebody, you know, you criticize me, you're telling me I'm not meeting some standard and expectation. Oh, my I can counterattack you. I'll get, I'll get angry, you know, and uh, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. You know, you've got A, B, C, D wrong with you. Who are you to be talking about me? I want to take the spotlight off of me and put it on you. That's a good way of hiding. Uh, dishonesty is, you know, uh, I've got a report, you know, I know I was supposed to get it to you, I put it in the mail, I don't know what happened to it. I just tell a lie. Use dishonesty to hide. Uh, withdrawal is a problem, because if you withdraw, you're going to miss out on opportunities. And obviously, if you use dishonesty a lot, people will not trust you. If you use anger a lot, again, you're going to have the same problems uh, uh, that you know people have when they get angry very easily. People will not want to be around you very much, and you, it's hard to get your needs met. Okay, now, uh, so a shame timeout. Uh, I will talk about when uh, the uh, criticism comes from another person in a moment, but you ask yourself if there's a standard and expectation.
uh, that triggered the shame. You ask, is it realistic and is it compatible with who I am as a person? If it is not realistic, you got to let it go. You need to remind yourself again and again of why this standard and expectation is not realistic. For example, uh, where I am in life, I can't possibly hold myself up to standards and expectations that might have been realistic for me when I was in my 20s. It's just simply absurd. And even though they, those things may be imprinted in my mind, I need to get rid of them or I'm going to have a lot of shame to manage and uh, that I do not need to have. We have to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes it's not easy, but we have to let standards and expectations that aren't realistic a go. And you do that by telling yourself again and again why that's so. And eventually you can kind of, it, it will not bother you. Uh, if it is realistic, you know, it's something I'd really like to do. I can't do it well right now, but I think I could. Then I need to formulate a plan of action to improve myself so I can meet that standard and expectation. That's it. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's very, very straightforward. All right, now this is a little thing to mention before we move on about alcohol and emotions. Alcohol is our, you know, that's our culture's drug of choice. Now alcohol is a very in effective inhibitor of shame and anxiety. That's why people like to drink to some degree. Uh, the two emotional energies that are concerned with consequences. Alcohol disinhibits, though, anger, sadness, or interest, excitement. It does nothing to inhibit those emotions. So, uh, you know, uh, if you're uh, at a party or you're somewhere and you're enjoying yourself, you're doing some drinking, uh, the context may change very, very quickly. It was all interest, excitement, fun, and now somebody said something to insult you, and now the anger can come out. It happens nightly in all over the place. Uh, so we, we want to understand that anger and interest excitement themselves remove a concern for consequences. Now when people are drinking, they're looking to get the interest excitement and the fun, the enjoyment. But the combination of interest excitement and alcohol leads to a lot of bad decisions, right? You do things you're going to come to regret uh, the next day. Uh, it can be very, very consequential. And likewise, uh, anger and alcohol leads to uh, people doing things they really regret. I mean, they, they ruin their lives, they ruin the lives of other people. It's very hard to control a physical assault if you are under the influence of alcohol and you are angry. Very hard to turn it off. Uh, okay, so... Alright, the second building block is boundaries. Um, Alright, this just simply means an interpersonal boundary is saying no to another person. An intrapersonal boundary is saying no to yourself. Again, very firm, respectful anger. Not threats, not violence, not attacking their identity uh, is the best emotional energy to successfully establish boundaries. Uh, and again, inter interpersonal boundaries are needed if we are being frustrated, disrespected, or treated unfairly. Now that monkey, in the fervent monkey situation, that number five monkey, it had no ability to set boundaries. If you take a human being and you throw them in a situation where they have no ability to say no to another person abusing them, it's going to ruin them. It's absolutely essential that boundaries get set. Now some people uh, who say they were very abused when they were young and they literally could not really set boundaries very well. When they get bigger and stronger, they can set boundaries and oftentimes they do it uh, uh, in a very violent or unproductive kind of a way. But we have to be able to set boundaries. We have to say no to people, and we also have to be sensitive to their boundaries. You know, I mean, if I'm joking around with somebody and they find it disrespectful, I need to pick that up very, very quickly and turn it off. Otherwise, I'm not going to have a good relationship uh, with the person. I, 
intrapersonal boundaries are needed if we are being self-critical in a disrespectful fashion or our behaviors are violating so someone else's energy. boundaries. Now one thing about anger, and again going back to the vervet monkey situation, uh, those monkeys, except for number five, can redirect their aggression and anger at other monkeys. When we get angry sometimes, our anxiety or our shame guilt will prevent us uh, from being able to set a boundary with even respectful anger. Where is that going to go? We could let it out on an innocent person, which I discussed earlier. We can also turn it on ourselves. I mean, you know, we have the capacity to get very angry with ourselves. And if that anger, self-anger, is expressed in a disrespectful way, ripping apart the identity, for example, really common, calling yourself uh, uh, you know, a weakling, uh, uh, attacking your gender identity, your identity as a man or a woman, uh, you're a, you know, I'm a loser, I'm this, I'm that. That cannot continue. Uh, this will keep a person trapped in uh, difficulties, emotional difficulties. What has to be done is, the, if you are angry at yourself, you need to put the brakes on the instinctive anger, which is always disrespectful, and reword, rewrite the script. Express it in a respectful way. Yeah, I messed up here. I didn't pull it off the way I wanted to. Um, it, it's painful. I don't like it. I have to improve. Be respectful to yourself when you're angry at yourself. Now, People who hear voices, you know, who have auditory hallucinations, and they get a diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia, say. Um, those voices that people hear are mostly very contemptuous, cruel uh, voices, and they're usually got a good deal of anger. You know, they, the voices tell the person uh, what's wrong with them in a very disrespectful way. Now that's a hard thing for somebody to deal with, uh, uh, but again, the the mechanism uh, uh, is is exactly the same. Uh, the voices are kind of dissociated, and they're harder to interfere with, and they're disrupted. But again, uh, maybe the person can learn to uh, uh, change their silent thoughts when when they're upset. Okay, so, uh, and, and again, obviously, if you want to have a good relationship with somebody, you have to be sensitive to their boundaries, even if you don't think they need them. Okay. Um, all right, so, I'm, not, I'm just going to move on here. Um, all right. Now the four need areas I'm defining are financial, material, stability, emotional support, community involvement, individual development. You can have more need areas than this, you can label them differently, but these are very, very important. Now, um, if we don't have these needs taken care of, we're going to suffer chronic emotional pain, which is different than everyday pain. Everyday pain is, you know, I'm walking down the street and I discover, oh, you know, I left my wallet back at the restaurant and then I'm going to be very upset. Now that's everyday emotional pain. It's important that I manage that in an adaptive way. And then it's, we get this every day. We have to manage the everyday kinds of pain that come. But if we don't have our needs taken care of, it's not going to be everyday pain. It's going to be chronic emotional pain that will not go away. And uh, a lot of lifestyles get constructed to deal with that. A lot of times people use alcohol and drugs. They watch TV a lot. Uh, in order to partially anesthetize the emotional pain that is being generated chronically because these needs aren't met. Um, all right, so to just elaborate on that, I, mean, I have here the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. This is an important distinction. The conscious mind is rooted in the modern world. It is very aware of modern technology, hospitals, supermarkets, food banks, homeless shelters, and telephone numbers. 
Uh, the conscious mind knows we can call 911 if we're sick. It knows an ambulance is going to come, take us to the hospital. Doctors and nurses will look after us. <clears> Hence, <throat> we know this consciously. The unconscious mind doesn't really know this stuff. It is rooted in a hunting, gathering, foraging world. A tribal world consisting of families banded together. Prehistoric times and in the modern world, people still are, are living in this, this fashion. It is not aware of the modern world. The unconscious mind constantly monitors our drive states and our thoughts to determine if our human needs are being met. If the unconscious perceives that our needs are uh, being inadequately attended to, it will transmit emotional pain. And we got to know, emotional pain is like physical pain. It's like if I lay my hand down on a hot burner on the stove, I'm going to get the most awful pain because I don't have much time to get my hand off before the tissues of my hand are destroyed. The intensity of the pain reflects the danger to my body. If I lay my hand down on a hot sidewalk, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to be nearly as bad as, as the burner on the stove. Uh, emotional pain is the same kind of a thing. As a matter of fact, the intensity of emotional and physical pain is, uh, has the same uh, uh, location in the brain in terms of where it's registered. Uh, and it, it's important to know that, uh, uh, you know, if you are having chronic pain, because these needs I'm going to talk about are not met, that has to be corrected. And uh, we'll go to that. Okay, so need number one. Financial material stability. This is in place if you and your family can reliably obtain the necessities of life. If the unconscious perceives that the preservation of material stability is at stake, it will generate chronic emotional pain, usually a combination of anxiety, frustration, anger. Now, if you live in a community, like a lot of people do here in the city of Chicago, where uh, there's never financial stability there. You know, it's going to be a lot of anxiety and worry about what's going to become of me, and there will be a lot of irritability among the people living there, which usually isn't managed very well. Now, how is that chronic pain taken care of? Uh, when you are in this kind of a situation, uh, drugs and alcohol, which and obviously alcohol is just another drug, these are used to anesthetize this chronic emotional pain. Because if, it's, if you don't anesthetize it somewhat, you're going to have a complete disintegration. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we just need to understand that uh, this is something which must be uh, addressed for mental health. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, an adequate emotional support system is in place if you are attached or bonded to four to six people with whom there is a mutual obligation to help one another if either of you or the other person is sick, injured, or in great distress. Now, obviously, um, you know, in the modern world, you can kind of ignore this. A lot of people make a mistake. They got hurt a lot in their life. They were traumatized. They've been rejected. They've been bullied. And they come to a place as an adult where they say, I don't want people. I don't need people anymore. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, what happens then is they are then burdened with chronic sadness, loneliness, and anxiety about, you know, who's going to be there for me? Who do I have? Uh, and then they usually will evolve a lifestyle to anesthetize the pain. Uh, and, and uh, so the unconscious mind does not care who's in your emotional support system. It can be any combination of significant other, family members, friends, associates at work, or in an organization. Uh, you know, a pet could count as you know, one or two, I guess, to give emotional support. Uh, the four to six figure is based on some research, but, you know, the idea commonsensically is if once you if you have four to six, you're pretty good shape, and the value of any additional uh, emotional support people is very minimal. But as you go down, you know, three is a lot better than two, one, or zero. But as you go down towards zero, the pain is going to increase. 
and it's going to become like, you know, hand on the hot burner instead of the sidewalk as you go down. Uh, uh, so it's very, very important to be aware of this. Uh, and, the un and again, the unconscious mind cares not who your friends are, who your associates are. It has, it's not concerned with their status, their this, their that. It just wants those in place. And it doesn't understand in the modern world, it's very easy to say, I don't need these people because I can call 911 and I'll have people to take care of me. If you're living in a primitive environment and you get sick or injured, you need people who are willing to put themselves on the line to protect you, heal you, carry you to safety sometimes. So uh, it's very, very important. Uh, okay. Third need is uh, community involvement. This is in place if you are a contributing member of a group cooperating together in order to achieve a goal or carry out a mission. Again, in a primitive environment, if you're in a little tribe uh, and you are not willing to contribute to the group, they will not carry you. You know, you'll get a horrible group shaming probably is the first step. And if you don't respond to that pain, uh, you're probably going to be kicked out of the group or killed. So you have to uh, understand, again, the unconscious mind doesn't understand the modern world where you could still live okay without being in a community involvement. And since, uh, uh, you, you know, and as I say there, uh, it really doesn't care, I say, it's satisfied with street gang or organized crime activity as it is with civic-minded pursuits. It doesn't care. It just wants you in a community involvement. Um, if the unconscious perceives that community involvement is absent, it will generate chronic emotional pain, usually a combination of anxiety and shame. And it's kind of alienation shame. You know, and again, it's like I'm an inferior person, uh, nobody wants to be with me, nobody's going to like me, they'll just tease me, reject me, humiliate me. Well, you know, that's going to be chronic. And what I, what I would say to a client, you know, somebody I might be working with, who again has been traumatized, hurt a lot in life, and they can make a decision, I don't want to be a part of any groups. I've already been there, I don't want to go there. But the problem is, they're trying to save themselves from being shamed and having these kinds of, you know, this kind of pain. But they're going to get it as long as they're not a part of something. So, you know, it's kind of you, it's a lose-lose type of situation sometimes for people in their mind. Uh, but if you get it in place, so for example, uh, in the modern world, you're not stuck, you're not born into one group and then you die in that group and you have to adhere to the uh, rules and regulations of the group. We have all sorts of options in the modern world. I can join this group over here, I can join this club, uh, there's lots of options. And, and I, if you want to have decent mental health and not have chronic emotional pain, make sure you're in something. <laughs> Just be a part of some community activity. And if it doesn't work out, leave it and go to another one. Okay. All right. Last one is uh, individual development. Uh, this is, you know, it's in place if you're acquiring new skills or improving skill sets that you've already assimilated. And again, the unconscious mind does not care what you're learning or improving. You could become a better criminal. Uh, you, you could do something very civic-minded. Uh, again, it wants you, again, if you're living in a primitive group, the expectation is that everybody is improving their knowledge of the environment. You know, weather patterns change, all sorts of things come up everybody needs to improve themselves. And again, if, it, if the unconscious mind registers that this is not in place, uh, you're going to get uh, uh, sadness and shame. Now this chronic emotional pain from unmet needs is a very, very serious thing. And many of the lifestyles which we identify in our culture and our society, which we say are deviant or, or they're, they're not any good, you know, like the addictions and all of that, are mostly uh, uh, ways that people evolve to deal with uh, uh, emotional pain. Okay. All right, so in summary, 
if you can manage emotions, everyday emotions and you know, chronic emotional pain in an adaptive fashion, you can set boundaries, you can say no to other people, and you can say no to yourself if you're disrespecting yourself, uh, and you make sure that your needs are met. You're going to be vaccinated against most mental health pathologies. Now, again, psychiatric medication is the last thing I'm going to say, then we can go to questions. Psychiatric medication can be viewed as necessary uh, in a, for a small subset of people who have problems such as uh, they're not able to gate out stimuli very well. They can't gate out sounds, sights, their own thoughts very well. It's almost a neurological uh, condition. Or they have problems, we call it the source monitoring problem. You can't tell whether something is coming from inside or outside. Uh, these are problems and of course medications will, if they work, they will be a very effective uh, anesthetic of the emotional pain and, and the discomfort. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, all of these psychiatric medications, and, and in the handout, uh, it's talked about in some detail. If they work, they will partially anesthetize your emotional pain. But it's not really the best option because they all have side effects, and they really can't take care of your human needs. I mean, a medication may, because it takes down your anxiety, say, may make it easier for you uh, to join a group uh, but, uh, you know, you have to join the group. You have to make sure your needs are taken care of. Okay, I think I'll just go to questions now. Okay, yes. Okay, please speak loudly, okay? Well, he'll be back, but he can self-monitor when we get started. Go ahead, Doug. I can go ahead? Yeah. All right, in your, in your presentation, oh, Doug. you focused on a lot of the negative emotions, Yes. but you said nothing about joy and love emotions, and also in anger, you totally skirted around the issue of assertiveness. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, let me, let me address that, uh, those, those issues. Uh, the, you know, interest excitement is the uh, primary positive emotion which has kind of a, uh, an ability to endure. Happiness and joy, I, and I should have uh, maybe mentioned this, comes when we actually achieve or consume you know, whatever it is we're trying to uh, accomplish with the interest, excitement, and motivation. Now, falling in love, uh, which is uh, a mixture of uh, the need, you know, for affection, uh, the need, I mean, you know, need for uh, uh, having another person. Uh, interest, excitement is generally the emotion that operates there. In, in most emotion theory, uh, feelings of joy or happiness are considered to be very, very brief and transient. And the reason that they're, you know, that, they're that way is, uh, okay, you know, you had your meal, you accomplished your goal, uh, uh, you know, now it's time to move on and uh, do something else. As far as assertiveness goes, what I really mean by uh, respectful anger is uh, what we would call assertiveness. That means, again, being able to say no to people, to take care of your needs uh, in a respectful way. And that's a very, very important skill. Yes? I guess the first questioner was referring to the movement of positive psychology. Martin Seligman talks about that and others. I wonder why you got interested in this field in the first place. You're wondering why I, I became it? Well, uh, you know, uh, I got my start uh, in a, in way back when I was in uh, uh, graduate school in psychology. And uh, this was all the way back in the uh, mid 
to late 1970s. Uh, and, and I was in a PhD program, uh, which I did not complete, but I was there for a number of years at the University of Connecticut. And we had some individuals there at that time uh, who were uh, working on emotion theory. And uh, so I started to learn about it all the way back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I uh, started my clinical training, actually many years later, at the Family Institute, uh, you know, in any kind of therapy or any kind of training, uh, emotion management is a key. You know, if you look at uh, psychodynamic approaches, you look at cognitive behavioral approaches, you look at any of the so-called, you know, the schools of uh, therapy, they all deal with emotion management one way or the other. So this, is an, this was done uh, in order to kind of boil it down and uh, make it in a form that people out in the community uh, would be able to understand and hopefully use some of it to uh, change their behaviors. <coughs> yes. Um, the um, thing about living um, your, your environment, um, I'm interested in, and that is um, there are people that say, well, I could never live in a big city. And there's other people that say, I could never live anywhere but a big city, you know, if I'm invigorating like I do. The, the culture, my, my favorite uh, musical artists will, will come here when they're on tour, for example. Uh, Mark's talked about uh, rural life, but he just said it uh, led, leads to a type of idiocy. He didn't really mention the emotional health aspect. Uh, well, what is there a consensus? about what is the ideal size of community for the, uh, the average person, if there isn't even uh, such a thing as an average person? Well, I, th I think, again, you know, the, the way that I choose to uh, understand it, you know, and obviously there's always disagreements about all these things, uh, I look at it as, you know, we are evolved, or we were created, either way, to exist in small groups of people. And when you live in small groups of people, uh, everybody needs to contribute for, you know, to survive. And uh, uh, there's always going to be standards and expectations. Social conformity will always be an issue. Sometimes it may not, you know, an environment will change. The, po the population may get too large. I'll never forget uh, when, when I was in uh, family therapy training, uh, one of the things that was brought up in one of the many schools of family therapy was this example of uh, a, a horde of locusts which, you know, are very, very aggressive and so on, actually were morphed from uh, a species of very peaceful grasshopper. And as long as that species of grasshopper has adequate uh, food available and adequate spacing, uh, you know, they, there's no problems. But as the environment changes uh, and the, the spacing and the food is not sufficient, they will morph into a horde of locusts and become very, very aggressive. And I think that we have to understand, you know, we're, I mean, we live in uh, uh, a, a very, very different kind of environment than what we were sort of evolved or created uh, uh, to be. Uh, and our emotions are rooted in that as opposed to, you know, this. So you're really saying that up. the change in environment may be even more important that if someone moves from a small town uh, as an adult to New York City, that change may be the thing that no, is something they're not used to? Well, I, I would just say, you know, people may have preferences for, you know, the country or the city or, you know, whatever, but you have to have your needs met. You know, you have to have an emotional support system, the community involved. You have to have it in place whether you're in New York City or in, you're in rural Indiana or something. You know, it's got to be, uh, got to be in place. Thank you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, Dan, um, yes. very often I'll listen to the guys here at the college and then I'll say something like, I don't think 
you know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> they are very angry with me. Do you think they need emotion management? <laughs> uh, well, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 what is, I mean, the thing, you know, the thing is, again, if they express their anger to you, in a respectful way, I would say, you know, from a, a mental health point of view, that's the pain we have to absorb, even though we don't like it, you know, it's still pain, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, a lot of life is taking emotional pain. Uh, I, I would say, you know, with the boundary, I, I didn't really say it, but I'll do it here. Uh, look, one of the boundaries we cannot have for ourselves is that you know, everybody has to like us 100% because that is completely unrealistic. You know, if somebody likes 65% of who I am, that's probably the best deal I'm ever going to get. And a lot of people don't like much of me. And, you know, I have to take that pain, but I do have to set a boundary on the repetition of it, you know. I get it, you don't like my clothes, you don't like the way I think, you, you don't like my political beliefs, etc., etc. But uh, uh, I'm not going to forget that. I just appreciate it if you don't beat me over the head with it every day. And that's all, because that will be a problem. So, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Are there uh, any pills you recommend for these problems? I, I tell you, uh, this is what I tell all anybody I've ever worked with. Uh, if you decide to take medication, um, you need to know that uh, you know it is a drug, and uh, uh, it, it's not something which is just a free ride. If you're going to take medication, it's in your interest to have it be at the lowest dose that you can get away with. Uh, because the danger of these most of these psychotropic medications is the higher the dosage level, the longer you take it in your age, these are the risk factors for side effect problems that sometimes can be permanent. I mean, they're serious. Uh, and obviously the antipsychotic medications which are given out these days for anxiety, insomnia, they give it to kids. Uh, th this is a huge mistake because they are very, very dangerous medications and should only be used uh, uh, with great care. So that's, I, I would say, if you take it, keep the dosage low. You're better off staying away, if it's possible, from antipsychotic medications unless you really need it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so they often say laughter is the best medicine. Now, some people say, Don, I take myself too serious. And uh, so I think about that a lot and it helps. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it, again, uh, uh, it, it's really, you know, I think going back to uh, the old psychodynamic ways of, of looking at things, humor was considered to be one of the very mature defense mechanisms. And, uh, you know, if we can laugh, you know, uh, uh, it's very, very helpful because, in a way, uh, a lot of times you're laughing at things which otherwise might be kind of painful. Yes, yeah, it's good. Sid Collins and then Ernie Norman. What do you think of Pavlovian condition reflex theory? Well, I, I mean, you know, that's something which is valid. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty much a situation where uh, you know if you uh, uh, associate, you know, for example, if somebody comes up and and hits somebody, uh, uh, and you know the person is not able to defend themselves, they're just getting bullied. Well, what they're going to do is everything in that environment that's immediately surrounding them is going to be a signal that that may happen. Uh, uh, and, you know, you just simply get conditioned. A lot of anxiety, look, most anxiety management, whether you're dealing with what they call, you know, classical conditioning or operant conditioning, what, what it really amounts to is uh, what they call exposure and response prevention. You need to expose yourself to whatever it is that you're afraid of 
And the idea is, you know, over time, uh, the fear will go away. Uh, you know, if you're if you've got uh, beaten up in a, a you know, say in a, in a certain kind of room, uh, you know, you may then be afraid of uh, being in some sort of a place that reminds you of that. You'll get an automatic joke. Uh, but if you, you know, expose yourself to the room, or if you're afraid to, you know, go to heights, you expose yourself to the heights, or whatever it is, uh, the fear will start to die down. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an essential part of uh, anxiety management if it's maladaptive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of administrative questions, hopefully you can shed some light on. Uh, not too long ago, the city closed 12 clinics and cut it down to six. And I hear before that, it used to be 24, they cut it down. How much money are they really saving? And what are the problems uh, for the patients that are caused by this? You know, other than just the inconvenience of going further. And secondly, Tom okay. Dart says that 40, 30, or 40 percent of the people in the county jail are, are mentally ill and really shouldn't be in a punitive situation, but a mental health situation. Can you comment on those two things? Yes. Um, yeah, I used to, uh, uh, I started working for the city back in uh, 98, 1998. And uh, I worked for many, many years at uh, Northtown Rogers Park Mental Health Center located in East Rogers Park. Uh, we were closed down in April 2012. Uh, we were six of the 12 centers that were left. Uh, obviously, that was a very, very painful uh, experience for everybody involved. Uh, I believe that uh, it is a huge mistake to shut down these mental health centers, public health mental health centers, because for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we are in an environment in the United States today where, you know, austerity measures, in other words, eliminating a lot of spending on social needs um, is, is occurring. And we need to have a safety net in the city of Chicago where if some of these clinics may go out of business uh, because they're simply not going to have access to the funding that they used to have. And so, uh, I, you know, I mean, obviously, I believe that uh, nonprofit mental health centers ought to be funded. They ought to be able to do the work, and they ought to be able to try to innovate and create better ways to uh, help people. And uh, the, it, it's uh, as far as the reasons why these centers are shut down. It's not really, and this is my belief, and other people might uh, describe it differently. It's because uh, the attitude of uh, the mayor and the administration is that uh, uh, things need to be privatized. We should not have uh, public health clinics. They already eliminated the primary clinic care, care clinics. The salaries are too high. The benefits are too good, um, and the union is a problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the the real thrust from the standpoint of the city administration is really directed against uh, the the centers and the employees, and etc. Uh, and what what was the other uh, Tom Dart? Yeah. Okay. Tom Dart has uh, been a real advocate of. Uh, you know, kind of, we need more mental health centers because, uh, you know, our jail is becoming the number one provider. But I would say, you know, one of the things that I wish Tom Dart would consider in addiction to that is that that Cook County Jail creates mental health problems. I mean, uh, anybody who's going through Cook County Jail or the prison system, you're going to have mental health problems if you never had them before. And, and uh, you know, I wish he was out there talking about that, too. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people get scooped up uh, who actually, uh, you know, maybe they, st they stop their medication. You know, look, if you're taking medication 
you can never stop at 100% because it's addictive. You become dependent on it, and if you stop at 100%, it's going to kick you. You're likely to have a very serious breakdown. But people do that a lot, and things can happen. David Trask. Ah, uh, you mentioned uh, a while ago that uh, it would be a good idea to stay away from psychotic, from antipsychotic drugs. Yes. Uh, so I, I've been feeling very bored with being normal. Could you recommend a good psychotic drug? In other words, you want to become psychotic? Well, you remember back in the 1960s, uh, LSD, psychedelic drugs, you might get... Try that. See how you do with that. Hey, Jeff. I'm right here. I don't want... No, no camera, Tim. No camera, please. Uh, okay. I was struck during your talk by your implicit but not explicit, as I understood it, references to issues of the judgments that people need to make in their lives, whether it's their weighing how ashamed they ought to be of this or that, or how anxious they ought to be of this or that. It would seem to me as though in a lot of cases folks end up getting into trouble because they make bad judgments about who they can trust, among other things. And when you talk about involvement in the community, well, what part of the community? Well, you know, and the, and the point being, in other words, uh, you know, you can. There's all sorts of different parts of the community, and some of them is it would insofar as you can agree that in principle some of them might be much more trustworthy for a particular person. Yes. How does the issue of trust and judgment come into play in any quasi-therapy that you might be of a mind to recommend? Trust and judgment? Yeah, yeah. trust and judgment. Okay. Judgments about who to trust and other things. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I mean, you know, clearly, uh, you know, trust uh, from, a, I'll say, maybe a you know, psychotherapy point of view. Trust is something which gets built up over time. We have to be able to see somebody perform over time, then we come to trust them. You know, for example, uh, in the addiction world, uh, you know, 12-step meetings, etc. cetera, uh, when, when is it that you can actually trust somebody? Well, if you see that they have been, let's say, clean and sober for three months, that's good. I mean, they're really doing something, but three months clean and sober is not the same as one year. And obviously, one year is not the same as two years. Uh, when it comes to some of the other things I was talking about, now, if somebody, let's say, I'm trying to have some sort of a relationship with of any kind, and they constantly get angry with me in a disrespectful way, I'm going to try to ask them to stop doing that. You know, I'm not going to say you can't get angry with me, but at least be respectful when you do. Now, if I see that they cannot do that, okay, they're simply either unwilling or not capable of doing it, then I cannot trust them, obviously, to treat me with respect, and I have to put distance between myself and that person. You know, that, that I think is, is essential kind of a thing. Now, if you get involved in, in a group, um, again, uh, uh, can you trust the people in a group? Well, time will tell. And if you are in a group, a community involvement, where people are, uh, you know, you feel that you are being oppressed, disrespect and treated unfairly, obviously you should not stay in, in that group. But trust is something which, you know, again, over time we can come to trust somebody and uh, that I hope that answers your question somewhat. Okay, Dan. Man? Yeah, all right. Um, do you think that uh, Mayor Garcia will reopen all the mental health clinics? Well, uh, you know, uh, that's not 
clear. It's not clear. Hopefully he would. Uh, I mean, the, the because look, uh, he has uh, a different kind of a focus uh, where he is uh, talking about communities which tend to be somewhat neglected in the city of Chicago over the years. Um, you know, and I mean, uh, this uh, Chicago is deindustrialized, and I, I think anybody who travels out on the south side or the west side of the city knows we have a lot of wastelands out there. It's pretty bad. Uh, uh, and that's just an unfortunate thing that has happened to Chicago. Mental health, I do feel very strongly that whether it's Mayor Emanuel or Mayor Garcia or whoever it is, that they would recognize it's important to be able to have people out in these communities uh, uh, giving folks information about how they can maintain their mental health or create conditions with, you know, which are good for mental health. Uh, yeah, I have a kind of a follow-up question that Charlie mentioned. Uh, we talk about different issues, uh, you know, on Saturday night. And my question is, you can be talking about uh, certain issues. If people are familiar with the facts, they will agree with you and say, well, that's common sense. Everybody knows it. But if you give somebody a fact that counters their belief because they're unfamiliar with it, they will attack us verbally. Yeah. Um, you know, what is the mechanism that allows people to go on believing something long after the facts have proven them to be false? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, again, you know, the pro. I mean, again, if you you may remember at one point here, I was saying, uh, be very careful about crossing the line where you make a decision or you crystallize a belief. I mean, the idea is. Uh, usually if you have a belief about something or you made a decision, it implies action. And if you're going to take action in the real world, you can't be all vacillating. Should I? Shouldn't I? Is it a good idea? Not a good idea. So when you actually cross over to a belief or you get imprinted with a belief, uh, it's very hard to walk it back. And what happens is people will, uh, uh, you know, adhere to their belief and they will minimize the counter evidence that you may present or they will rationalize it away. Again, going back to when I was talking about depression. If somebody has a belief that their future is absolutely hopeless uh, and I say to them, no, you know, your future uh, can't possibly be hopeless. It's the future. It hasn't happened yet. It's not a permanent loss. But what I will, you know, confront is the person has crossed over that line, and they believe that's that's it. They will have easy access to all information which supports that belief, and they will not have easy access to the counter evidence. And if you present the counter evidence, they will minimize it. Yeah, okay, but what about this, this, and this? Uh, uh, or they will just simply rationalize it away. You know, you're trying to. Uh, 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 push some sort of a political agenda or whatever you know it may be so you know people here uh, or anywhere you know everybody's got their beliefs and uh, again it's very hard to walk it back I mean for example you know I listened to you know your presentation I thought it was a really good presentation I, I, you know and I thought you were presenting uh, a lot of information which was very worthy of consideration but uh, uh, you know, uh, if, I, if somebody says to you, or they may say to me, on certain things that I believe, uh, you know, that doesn't make sense to me, or I can't believe that, you know, that's not going to convince us to let it go. You know? I mean, once the belief is there, it's just very, very hard to let it go or walk it back. And when people... Uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, I kind of missed the beginning of your presentation. I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, uh, but I was wondering, so you might have covered this, but what I was wondering is, that, do you still practice mental health? And um, if you do, where do you do it? And what kind of um, therapeutic approach do you use? Well, I, I still work, uh, you know, for the city of Chicago. 
Department of Public Health at uh, North River Mental Health Center. Uh, and you know, uh, where, where is that? Uh, that that's located uh, over by uh, North Park Village up at uh, 5801 North Pulaski. Um, well, I mean, my you know, my my approach to uh, mental health is reflected in what I'm presenting here. I mean, to me, uh, w with certain individuals, uh, you know, you have to uh, relate to them differently, obviously, you know, in, in terms of talking with them or listening to them. But at some point, I want to try to uh, have the person uh, understand the things that I'm talking about here. <clears throat> and I emphasize that it has to be practiced and rehearsed. For example, if, I, if I'm going to, you know, give you a boundary and say, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, the next time you're upset with me, uh, I really would appreciate it if you don't yell, because when you do yell at me, it makes me feel very disrespected, it hurts me. Um, now, I may have to rehearse that in my mind, because in the emotional moment, if I don't rehearse, <laughs> or practice, I may not be able to pull it off. And, and any of these things, whether it's emotion management or boundary setting, they, it has to be practiced and rehearsed. You know, rehearse, you imagine it in your mind doing it, and then practice, you do it. And after a while, you get good. All right, Tim Folger. Okay, um, what, what, you know, in light of what Ernie was saying, and I know that all these mental health clinics have closed, what has happened to all these, I mean, what has happened to all these people? I mean, where where can they get, you know, like I heard that like C4, it doesn't accept people who don't have insurance. Well, now things have changed with Obamacare, so I don't know what they're doing. But where have all, I mean, this, this is crazy. I mean, there's, you know, there's millions of people and there's six centers. Where, where are these people going to get their mental health needs met? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it from one point of view, you could say, well, the mental health needs in the city of Chicago are enormous. There's problems all over the place if you define them uh, in, a, in a certain way. There, there could, there's never going to be enough money, uh, enough personnel to be able to deal with everything in terms of, you know, therapy. Uh, uh, but uh, what's happened is uh, a lot of people develop lifestyles to take care of their emotional pain, as I was talking about. They use drugs, they use alcohol, they, you know, there's different things. Uh, a lot of people, look, a lot of people don't want to come into a mental health center in the first place. They do not want to receive a diagnosis. They do not want to put themselves in that situation for all sorts of reasons. And my personal attitude is they really shouldn't have to do that that, you know, people ought to be able to come if they have problems or they need assistance with, you know, managing various things. You know, you shouldn't have to be diagnosed. You should not have to be put in certain kind of situations. But the, the reality is insurance money will not be paid out, any kind of insurance, unless you have a diagnosis and uh, uh, usually medication will be uh, the you know, preferred form of intervention. People a lot of times have to resist it. Uh, there's, there's not enough clinics, uh, and there probably never could be. All right, I got a two-step question for you. First of all, you know, I, I attend a church on a regular basis on Sunday mornings. Can you comment on how institutions like that affect mental health? And second. You did an incredibly good presentation. Uh, have you taken this on the road, or was there a book involved? And then can you share a little bit about your personal background, about how you came to all these conclusions? Yeah, um, well, I mean, again, uh, you know, a church can be an excellent community involvement. I mean, clearly that's the case. Uh, you know, uh, if, if, I mean, because, if, again, think about, you know, going back to the, the issue of trust. Mm -hmm. You probably figure if you go to, let's say, most churches, um, there's a good likelihood that the people who are members of the congregation will be more respectful, let's say, than other groups. 
it, uh, it, it's probably a good place to find emotional support. And again, the unconscious mind does not care, again, whether you get it through uh, a church or you get it through a street game. Uh, it, it doesn't care. So obviously, a, ch a church is generally a, a good uh, place. Okay, and then on the second part, I, I come from a background where I do a lot of presentations in Toastmasters. I see you put a lot of work into this thing. Have you presented this before? Yes. And is there a book in the works? Uh, well, there may be. I may write. You know, I may uh, uh, write something uh, concerning this. Uh, I, actually, I created this uh, two years ago. This particular presentation. Um, you'll notice when, if you have the handouts, you'll notice that uh, it's still talking about that, the DSM-4. Uh, the reason I did it was uh, there, there was. Uh, uh, a, a group of people, kind of the, the mental health movement, uh, a group called uh, Southside Together Organizing for Power out in West Woodlawn, uh, and they asked me and a number of clinicians to create some presentations to actually be taken to churches uh, in, around the city. And for two years, uh, we would go around to various churches uh, and, you know, I, I would do this presentation and other individuals would do uh, the presentation. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thought uh, about this is, uh, you know, books, uh, and, you know, there's, there's a part of my ego that would like to have a book or, you know, this kind of thing. But, but the thing is, the information, you know, most people aren't going to read books. Uh, you know, Andy, like uh, when you were talking about uh, that, uh, that issue. I mean, there's a zillion books. There's so many books on therapy and psychology, emotion management. And, and what the hope was, it, it didn't work out exactly the way it was envisioned, but the idea was, let, let's give people, we can give them a handout, you know. Uh, uh, we can uh, explain these things. And by spreading it around uh, in a way, you know, we didn't, I mean, always done for free and, and everything. The, the idea was that uh, the information could be disseminated and people would pick it up. So you would have no objection then if I, if somebody asked me to share your handouts or outlines? Well, I, I did, uh, you know, I did copyright it. I mean, I, no, no, I, I mean, I mean, you but, know, yeah. if, with with your permission. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please. I Do mean, it. if somebody emails me and asks, I'm not going to put it up there on the web, but if no, no, ask, please pass it on. Yes, absolutely. You know, and for anybody, if you know anybody uh, who would like to have this information, yeah, definitely That's, pass it on. Pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we are trespassing now on. Your rebuttal period, where you get to impart your wisdom to the rest of us, uh, and uh, I wonder how many more people have plans. Oh, question. Oh, no, question. Uh, I got rebuttal. Uh, uh, rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal time. Rebuttal. It's rebuttal time. I would like to see the hands of those who have something. To all right, first, Brown, we got to thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, and I do want to just say this. Uh, I did not know about the College of Complexes for many, many years. Uh, I, I think it's a great uh, kind of a forum. I definitely is, uh, you know, allows for uh, free speech, and, and, and I feel really good about being with everybody here. Thank you. I want to warn you all, Dan gets the last rebuttal. So, you know, Should we sit down, Brown? Should we sit down now? Now. Would you raise your hand? He's asking for a show of hands. Show of hands for rebuttals. Bill, Gary. Show of hands for rebuttals. Should we sit? We don't have the timer. We, we're going to have. Uh,
We can we can go up here. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. What do you say, Brom? Four or five minutes. How long, Brom? Four minutes. We'll go five. Five minutes. I'll get a timer set up. Sure, an extra copy of that and uh, anywhere. I can copy it for you, girls. I can make a copy of it for you. No, that's all right. Hello. I'll get the first rebuttal tonight. Uh, so while my thoughts are still clear and while everybody is still here, rather than uh, dribbling on out one at a time, it just gets a little ragged here in half an hour. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is L.P. Anderson, the, everybody calls me Andy, and my brother and I, as a hobby, we run what we call the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. We, it's a, basically a database translation service. We take books like this one, uh, this is Sensor News, but we'll, we'll take a bunch of books on one subject and translate that mass, the, the, the wheelbarrow full of paper, into a, a one-page cliff note that somebody can read in five minutes. Because as he pointed out, a lot of people don't have the inclination or the energy or the time to read a lot of books. Nobody has time to read 20 books a week. Censor News, Project Censored out of Sonoma State, is a journalism, it's probably the most prestigious journalism project in the world. They publish this book every year. It's been up and running for 37 years. They publish a book with the top 25 blacked out stories in America that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than intentionally suppressed and blacked out by the media. Censored News, Project Censored. They got a website, projectcensored.org. Uh, they got all the archives going back 20 years. So they teach journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist in America, because there's certain things you can't talk about on the airwaves or you just get instantly fired. Um, one of those things you can't talk about, of course, is the myth that people are living under that we were attacked by crazed Muslims on 9-11. Uh, that's, that myth is driving a bunch of uh, things that are happening with the militarization of America, the, the concept that we have a national security problem, uh, homeland security. The police, the police in various places are practicing shooting uh, mostly black people to see what they can get away with and see how much the American public is going to tolerate. All of this has come about <clears throat> driven by the myth the myth of what happened on the morning of 9-11. Uh, in reality, uh, something else is going on. I pulled some flyers out of the past uh, things that we, we published 10, 15, 20 years ago. One of my favorite books was a thing called With Enough Shovels, published by Robert Shearer in 1983. With Enough Shovels. And he talked about a man named T.K. Jones who said, the man was an executive of a Boeing aircraft. He was driving around, the, flying around the country in the Reagan administration, uh, having high-level business meetings with business leaders, saying there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. You, you dig a trench out back of your house, put a couple doors, in, uh, dirt, put two doors over that trench, pile up three feet of dirt, and then you can sit under the, in the trench under that pile of dirt until a radioactive cloud is drifted over. There's no problem with nuclear war as long as everybody has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. You know, the, the doctors, physicians for social responsibility said, this man is not in an assailant site or somewhere. He's not in a rubber room being guarded and medicated. He's in the president's cabin. This kind of insanity, lack of grasp on reality, is found throughout the American public, all the way to the top, on various key issues where the press is not informing us on what's going on. So things can get better if people know that, uh, as Rocky Mountain Institute pointed out, we can bring the troops home from everywhere, and they should have a minute left. Okay. Uh, I got my timer. Uh, 
There's a revolution going on. You might have seen the ads in Chicago about uh, no, no, solar panels. Shown in our eyes. Uh, solar panels oh, generate no. electricity to burn the bulb for this. You can buy it from the oh, utilities Charlie, now. Charlie. There's been a revolution in that, like cheap computers, cheap cell phones. There's a total global revolution going on in energy efficiency and green technology, which can enable us to move very rapidly away from coal, oil, nukes, and gas. The future could be a lot brighter than what we see if the press would cover it, rather than promoting the idea that we need nuclear power, that we need more coal plants. Incidentally, uh, the idea that nuclear power can make any kind of difference has been obsolete for over 30 years, but some people are still promoting it. You know, in, 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 there's all kinds of things. If you, if you start, start with a copy of Sensor News, okay. And uh, just start with a copy. This is the 212 edition, but the 214 edition has a bunch of good information also. You learn uh, a bunch of good things that's going on everywhere compared to what the media tells us. Anybody has any questions on uh, any of this stuff, come see me afterwards. I have some cards with the website on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, I'm Gary Levitt. Uh, I will try to say something I hope very relevant to this talk. I've been seeing therapists since around the sophomore junior year in high school, and I feel worse about my family's future than I did at the beginning. A teacher in a, 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 a gym teacher in junior high said I was lackadaisical on the basketball court. Emotionally, I wasn't really suited to performing in public that way, and I'm not sure I was so physically gifted. I was as smart then as I am now. I would have said, do you think I'm impressed by you using a big word like that? Hippocrates was called the father of medicine, and Freud put therapy on the map, so how advanced can mental health care be compared to the physical health system? I've had the problem of pulling my hair out, trichotillomania, hoarding papers, it's hard to throw out papers. We don't have regular mental examinations, unlike physical. And Ben Franklin said, and also C.C. Halliburton, yeah. in an uh, advertisement for a Consumer Reports health publication, said this as well, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I needed help in grade school, and I didn't get it. Um, especially, you know, for self-understanding is so critical for people who are going to be parents, which is, it can be very demanding. We're really raised by the society we live in influenced by not just parents, but the media, the neighborhood, the school, the house of worship. And I'm not sure the house of worship is as helpful as our speaker thinks it is, but that's a whole other topic. Um, happiness varies from country to country, and I think that has to do with the economic system, which Charles and other critics of capitalism might, uh, might speak to. There are so many self-help books, Deepak Chopra, Wayne Dyer, Dr. Phil, and someone criticized Wayne Dyer's presentations on Channel 11 to raise money as being seemingly a little bit out of touch with, you know, other things are like nature programs, uh, Rick Steve's going to Europe, historical programs, and uh, these spiritual ideas aren't necessarily quite as valid or uncontroversial as the other programs on Channel 11. Robert M. Price wrote a book called Top Secret, which he reviews uh, people like Wayne Dyer and others, and. Joel Osteen and looks at the maybe less than solid support of these modern spiritual and, and psychological movements. I forgive my relatives, but I'm not sure I can forgive people who hurt me in the community. Um, and the lady gave a talk at the Skokie Library how she was able to forgive her father, who after surviving the Holocaust took his anger in the at the world out on her and her brothers. And. Uh, why do people believe in astrology? You can see professional astrologers. And I got something from the internet uh, criticizing astrology from the Berkeley, UFC Berkeley, I think. The Tribune's Nancy Black astrology column is very curious. It, said, it seems everybody is successful. Everybody has a happy life. That's nonsense. There are some people in prison who are innocent. Some people feel bad. And uh, a lot of people kill themselves. And I'm not sure just reading more self-help books would necessarily make them feel happy about the future. 
Dan Gilbert is on TV with advertisements about prudential insurance. And he spoke at Northwestern once, and he, he says that money, you know, beyond a certain point, maybe 75000 a year, doesn't make you happier. But I've been feeling over the years that the only hope for our family is money. As a matter of fact, uh, there might be something fallacious about that. Just because you win a lottery doesn't mean you have to keep all of it. You don't know the future will be about inflation or how long you'll live, but you can be a philanthropist much more than if you were only making 75000 a year. I think we're generally pretty much getting up over us playing the lottery in our family, although when it gets really big, I still do, although there's no such thing as lucky numbers. You have to try not to choose numbers that other people will trust, like seven, that kind of thing. Well, I've been, uh, I haven't come every week, but the, the gradual of coming here and speaking is helping me get over my fear of public speaking, and in a few decades, if not centuries, I probably will be as comfortable as Charles and the others and uh, Brown and people like that. Just join Toastmasters. Just join Toastmasters. I went to one of those meetings at uh, the Morton uh, Grove Library. So, what else? We have to try to give constructive criticism. We have to know the difference between constructive and destructive criticism. It makes me wonder, you know, what if all the politicians were doing a good job, there was no war, and there was no terrorism? It would destroy the comedy industry. Most people, most comedians are making fun, like John Stewart, Letterman. Letterman could still make jokes about, you know, uh, double entendres about squirrels in their nuts. You know, last winter he saw squirrels putting salt on their nuts. But uh, we have to think of some other source of jokes. I don't know what we're going to do. But uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, I really love coming here. Thank you. Okay, next. Next speaker. No, I enjoyed the speech. I thought it was a very good speech. And it was more realistic than if you go to a psychiatrist who tries to make money off of you and doesn't even really have a cure for the problem. Uh, you have two forms of psychiatry. One is talking, and you can talk endlessly, and you can't get nothing done. I can talk about a glass of water there, but if I don't lift up the glass of water and drink it, it doesn't mean anything. So talking in itself is completely meaningless. The other form of psychiatry is uh, a mechanistic solution to the problem. They try to uh, change your body chemistry. Now the body chemistry can be changed in a lot of different ways. For instance, if somebody is fearful, they get the adrenaline going. And that's a form of body chemistry changing. Well, it's the same thing if you live in a type of society that tells you that the individual is more important than anything else in society. But yet, well, yet we live in a society that is very cooperative. And people try to solve problems on their own. And it can't be done. So, and that's one of the, the causes, I think, of mental illness, that if people stay to themselves, and one of the characteristics of mental illness is isolation from other people. So if you want to overcome a problem, you have to cooperate with other people to try to solve it. And you have to look for causes, causation. Now, when you go to a psychiatrist, he doesn't look for causation. It's all he does is, is give you a pill, or he starts talking and talking endlessly, and you don't get anywhere. When you start looking for causation, you try to resolve the problem. Like, for instance, like I said, if somebody is fearful of other people, he has to, he has to uh, get into a group and become very cooperative and very gregarious. And as a consequence of that, there's a body chemical change. And the person is able to relate with other people, and he becomes more healthy. And for instance, if somebody has a fear of something, like for instance, going outside, outdoors, well, he has to face up to it and go outdoors and resolve the problem. In other words, he has to act. People have to act in order to resolve any type of problem. And if you have, uh, let's say, a problem with the other, 
with, with the opposite sex. We have to start relating with the opposite sex. You might get rejected, but you learn from that rejection, and you try to resolve the problem in that way. You learn from your mistakes. And when you learn from your mistakes, you go ahead and, and resolve the mistake, and you can overcome the problem. And you have to have knowledge to overcome a problem. You can't just talk and talk and talk and take a pill and resolve a problem. And if you don't do that, if you don't look into the problem and see what it is and try to resolve that particular contradiction, you're not going to overcome it. There's no way you can overcome it. So psychiatry itself has become a big racket. It's a money-making racket. A lot of psychiatrists themselves go into psychiatry to solve their problems, and they can't solve it, some of them commit suicide. If you want to uh, solve your problem, you have to look for a psychiatrist that has the outlook of science in mind and how to resolve problems and what you do to resolve problems. Not just talk and talk and talk and give you a pill to change your body chemistry, which is all money-making nonsense. Okay. We got a little timer up here that tells us how long. But he has to get reset. I don't know what happened to him. Okay, I guess I just talk away. All right, I'm going to focus on my rebuttal. There's a lady over here uh, that I'm not, I don't see her anymore. She might have left. And uh, basically her question was about the clinic people. With all these clinics closed for mental health, where do the people go? And also, there's, uh, you know, to be in some of these agencies these days, you have to have Medicaid. If you don't have Medicaid, where do you go? Well, I I'm here to tell you that I'm what a part of what we call the underground recovery movement. Some of these things uh, you people have not ever heard of, and I'll just mention a few. Uh, there's a couple of groups that are involved with education of people with mental illness or their relatives or families or friends. Two of the groups, one group has the name of DBSA, and that stands for the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. And they have a group that meets up here at the Devon Bank 6445 Northwestern on the second Monday of the month in the basement of the bank, and they have education topics on mental illness recovery. You know, if you have trouble sleeping, uh, if you have to get uh, admitted to the hospital, uh, you know, what you have to go through for admission. The next group, uh, some of you may have heard, is NAMI, stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And they have uh, education groups uh, in the area, uh, and they're in Chicago and the surrounding suburbs, and they kind of do the same thing in different ways. I took a class from them in, in regards, the class was called Pathways in Recovery. And uh, so, uh, you know, there was a, a, a six-week class. We went through a big book about the different areas of recovery. And there was a, and it was written by a group of people out in Kansas. And uh, we followed that book, and it, it helps. Now, uh, one of the things that I am involved with is, is, is an organization called GROW. Now, this group came to... Uh, it was started in Australia by a group of recovering uh, former mental health patients, which included a, a Catholic priest in 1957 in Australia. And they developed a 12-step program for recovery. And, you know, in time, uh, what happened was that there was a psychiatrist, a psychologist, professor at the University of Illinois, that crossed paths with this priest. And he... The, and and the, the psychologist found out about uh, the GROW program, and he brought it to the States. Now, some of the topics that, 
we talk about in the GROW program, what statement we make is no one is a no-hoper. And we gather in groups of four to six or more uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, my group meets at St. Jerome's uh, Church Rectory Basement on Wednesday nights at six o'clock. And we talk about, you know, it's a very structured, focused program. Uh, we say no one is a no-hoper. There's hope for me, there's hope for you. And uh, even if someone does not have hope for themselves, the group will not let that person fail. We stand by that person on an ongoing basis. We have, you know, for things that go wrong, we have the comforting paradox. If things go wrong, they're meant to go wrong while you're growing. And uh, we have the four stabilizing questions. And that is, you know, an attempt to have people think by reason rather than by feelings and imagination. One question is, what exactly is wrong? The next question is, what is the probability of the question going wrong? And then uh, the last question is, if it's, if it's going to happen, what are you going to do about it? Uh, the other thing is, is in my travels through uh, underground recovery, I've been exposed to dialectic behavior therapy. And that's one of thinking of a rational mind versus an emotional mind. So there are things out there that you don't have to have a professional uh, to be involved with for your recovery and mental illness. Thank you. I'd love to put it in my pocket box. Sorry. Just give me a five. You know I don't do that deliberately. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, um, my name is Dan Weinberg. Uh, thanks a lot to Dan Bader for the talk. Um, I've, I've been uh, uh, talking about personal experience. I've been a uh, peer counselor for, for NAMI. I um, we appreciate I worked with a young lady and we uh, helped a young person with uh, mental health problems and drug problems and we listened to him and we talked to him and we were uh, amateur counselors I guess they have a program with um, with counseling in America uh, the, the, the insurance system is very skewed toward physical health but anything in your head Emotional problems are not treated very well by the insurance companies. Uh, there's always less money for psychological problems. Uh, there's always more restrictions on uh, mental health problems rather than cancer. There aren't many marches for depression or bipolar, but there are a lot of marches for cancer, all kinds of cancer. And so it's a prejudice. There's a natural prejudice against mental problems um, in America, probably all around the world. Because basically you can't see these problems. Uh, you can see a cancer, you can see a broken arm, broken leg, but you, it's hard to see psychological problems. So uh, the Greeks, what the Greeks do, they would push old people over the mountains or crazy people. If you were old and crazy, they push you twice. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, take my wife, please. She's crazy. No. Uh, that's that's all I got. Um, I would I would what? see. What did you say? No. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> Sorry. That one was funny. <laughs> I'm nuts. Uh -oh, I'm nuts. I must say I'm nuts too. <laughs> I was certified for a while. I had I was on disability and uh, yeah I had problems. Many problems, sleeping at O'Hare, things like that, and living at shelters, and times were tough. But now I'm, I'm cured by 
by uh, many things and many people, listening to people, and uh, talking. Thank you. I want to let everybody know that I really appreciate our speaker talking tonight. And I'm going to share with this audience a brief experience I had a few years ago uh, where I actually sought mental treatment through the VA. Um, there was some real issues in my life where I had felt that uh, I was becoming of a, like what we call a suicidal nature. And I honestly felt that I needed some counseling and some professional help to work through some major life issues at the time. I my reluctance for going to it in the first place was because of the record keeping involved but since some of the things that have come out recently they have kept it on a more confidential level i want to encourage all of you that there is a real big thriving problem and you can't get it solved through friends or family or other things please if you can take a chance try some basic mental health counseling because even though I was only in it for a very, very short time, it helped resolve some issues of consequence very, very well. And if there's one thing that I want to compliment our speaker tonight on, he did a very comprehensive, reasonable program on what good mental health looks like and the factors for affecting good mental health. I'd like to give another rousing round of applause to our speaker. Mike, you're next. Okay, now, now, wait till you get a clear camera shot. Okay, Brom. All right, let's go ahead and start. I was thinking of this rational urologically. And I think, um, I think people probably should smoke more pot and drink more. <laughs> I'm up for that. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm working, actually I'm working on a couple of cannabis stores doing their security systems. And, uh, and I think that might, uh, might help for people that, you know, I think that uh, marijuana probably, you know, has an effect on your, on different senses. And maybe, you know, so maybe a healthy way to, yeah, get stoned and drink. I think there should be more of that. Of course, you don't want to drive or, you know, do things, anything dangerous. But I mean, it should be with that. And then I was just looking, of course, everybody can go to Wikipedia. And lo and behold, the leading sales. I guess there's a trillion dollars in pharmaceutical sales in the world every year. And a third of that goes to the U.S. And lo and behold, the biggest selling drug in America is Abilify. Not the most prescribed, but the, I think it's seven billion in sales. And it's for psychosis and depression. In the top ten, it's, that, that's the number one, and the next drug in sales is gastrointestinal disorders, it's two. Crohn's disease, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis is three, cholesterol is four, asthma is five, rheumatoid arthritis is six, and at seven, depression and anxiety disorders. And rounding out the rest is multiple sclerosis drugs. So, anyway, um, but you know, more I'm thinking about it is that uh, maybe marijuana is a healthy alternative to uh, depression. And, uh, 
anxiety. Oh, yeah. I I'll have to think Thank about that some more. Thank you. Go ahead. Please change the camera. All right, when you're ready. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. All right, well, I'm going to make what might be called some epistemological points from the standpoint of as I happen to be, a particularly well-educated retired cop. A few minutes ago, Tim talked about the idea of getting therapy. Okay? But part of the problem is that my understanding is, my non-expert understanding is, that there are more or less as many major schools of thought in the therapy, psychiatric, etc. world, as there are major religions in the world. And, as in the case of religions, in all likelihood, only one at most could be completely correct. Now, when you would go to any therapist, you might want to, before you do it, get some idea of what school of thought this, ther this therapist subscribes to. And you might, for that matter, want to bone up some at least on the nature of this school of thought and some of the major, at least the major criticisms of that school of thought by the other schools of thought. And this is particularly, if anything, relevant to the issue of mental health, the way cops see this sort of thing, when it is argued that we should see to it that mental health facilities are provided to the likes of the inmates. Well, okay, guys, which school of thought is going to be the one that's applied. And how do we know that whichever school of thought is applied to a particular patient is any better than any of the others? And, by the way, insofar as the individuals who are getting the therapy are not under 24-7 surveillance, how could we know which approach is better than the others, since we are not in complete control of the stimuli to which the individuals are being subjected when they're not under the 24-7 scrutiny. So it's nice in theory to suppose that therapy will help these folks, but from what I know, and again I'm not going to claim to be an expert, we really only can make very wild guesses as to how much good any of this stuff can do. And there's a further problem, and that is, of course, that we are relying, in large measure anyway, especially when we've not got them under 24-7 surveillance, we're relying on their testimony with respect to the effectiveness of whatever treatment they're getting. And, as the speaker actually alluded to a bit here and there in his talk, the human capacity for self-deception hardly has limits. So when you get a report from a patient about how he's doing, for all you know, the patient might be experiencing feel-good ploys, so to speak, by either the drug or the therapy, as the case may be. And the patient might not actually be in a position to give an authentic, reliable report as to what the consequences are. Now, I don't know the latest on how this stuff can be measured 
by means other than testimonial means. And who knows, maybe someday I'll actually be impressed by evidence to the effect that there can be some other reliable measurements. But until such time as those measurements themselves go through the scientific scrutinization process, I have to treat all proposals to, to for instance, provide mental health therapy towards jailhouse inmates with a great deal of skepticism, especially insofar as major coin is involved. Next. Okay, Brom. Can you get up? All right. You want some more soup, honey? I just want to say, I'm sorry to my wife. I didn't mean to say she was crazy. She's very sane. Very sane. Very nice. All right. Next. You'll have the divorce papers tomorrow. <laughs> I remember when I was uh, working for the Socialist Party that I had a little car correspondence with uh, uh, Eric Kroll, uh, who wrote uh, The Sane Society, and he was an actual socialist uh, uh, living uh, between uh, Switzerland and uh, Mexico. Uh, I think uh, Mexico got the uh, winter season. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but when it comes to making a sane society, I'll give it back. Or no, I'll give it back. Whether it's your family or, or uh, your thank you, sweetheart, uh, your church. The churches can go a little insane too. Uh, uh, or, or your therapy group, you know, uh, madness, a little madness, everybody's got it, uh, and uh, you've got to uh, wrestle with it and recognize it, and uh, just because uh, there are so many no, no, different uh, religions uh, and uh, so many different theories about uh, about mental illness doesn't mean that you don't have to recognize <laughs> when you've got a problem. And, uh, and think out some method of dealing with it. Uh, and the world is full of problems. Uh, Jesus was known as a healer. Yes. And uh, that was what he wanted his, uh, his disciples uh, to be. He sent them out. Two by two. That was uh, good uh, uh, psychology. Uh, the, uh, it, the one could uh, back up the other or correct the other, uh, and uh, were at least witnesses uh, to what was going on, so you have some sort of record of uh, how uh, people dealt with the various demons of our society, uh, or his society, anyway. And uh, it's good to have two people uh, around who are concerned with you and your problem, and uh, who will sit down with you and hear you out. And that's what they did. And uh, they were able to cast out people. Uh, and certainly when it comes to uh, Cook County, it's uh, the largest uh, psychiatric uh, facility uh, in the United States. 
Cook County Jail. And, uh, you know, if you don't have some uh, therapists around, uh, some people who understand the kind of problems that people are dealing with and uh, their methods of dealing with them, you're going to compound those problems as Cook County Jail uh, no doubt uh, it certainly does. Uh, I, I, if you don't invest in mental health, you're going to reap the consequences. Uh, I spent uh, a little time as a uh, an organizer, a community organizer for uh, a psychiatric uh, facility on the New York State Department of Mental Health grant uh, in uh, New York, uh, actually uh, uh, Brooklyn and Staten Island. Uh, and uh, uh, just helping people who were coming out of uh, mental hospitals to adjust and to uh, acclimate and uh, get, we have cooking uh, groups, uh, we, because many had lost uh, the ability to, they been institutionalized for years, but they, they didn't know how to shop or to cook or uh, how, how to uh, deal with the, the, uh, the prices or, or, or the, uh, or, or just uh, going outside of their, their own uh, dwelling. Uh, they might be able to have rent an apartment with little assistance, but uh, you're, you're over. Yeah. Already I'm over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I knew you had to do it, but you still have yeah. one on there. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Oh, yeah. You guys are with me to see you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very good. All right, and you won't thank me after what I've got to say, maybe. Uh, oh, we just heard it here. Yeah, we don't need mental health clinics. We can just send out 12 apostles. No, thank you. Let them blow, blow, blow. You know, everything will be fine, you know. According okay, to there's a... Uh, a lot for the city, Charlie. There's a lot of theories of personality here. I guess this is one you've developed pretty much on your own. It's a very useful, uh, practical analysis. Uh, there's many out there if you want to look into them. Um, there's other approaches to, uh, how can I say, psychology. There's a behaviorist approach which doesn't get into this area. They're, they profess to be more scientific and um, wouldn't recognize these types of analysis that you came up with of human behavior. It's like I, I was thinking of one like, I, I, from physics, I, I was, actually came up with my own. I was going to work on something where I had, in physics, they have the fundamental unit uh, of energy and things like that. But in, 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 in terms of people, I came up with one called the interaction. And that's how I was going to analyze it. And it, yeah, there is a thing, the other schools like stimulus and response you were talking about. That's more behaviorist approach to psychology, which they kind of deal with, but not a great deal with, much like that. I will tell some stories, though, as a union representative for many, many years, uh, employees come to my office mainly because they've had some situation develop either among with their co-workers or with their supervisory personnel. And we generally give them, I, I, I even gave it a term called intake, where I listen to their situation and read over the material that they may bring with them. If, if I detect any, unfortunately, if I detect anything in their narrative 
that doesn't strike me as well. I will often try to refer them to like an employee assistance program. Now I, I have a very low threshold for doing so, but it, it sometimes is necessary to recognize that some people have some problems here. Rather than ending up in some extended litigation or arbitration or appeal process, when that doesn't achieve anything. And I'll be square with the, the employers as well. I'll level with them. If it's a substance abuse situation, I don't, they, don't, don't muck around. You know, let, let's deal with the facts and the situation and have our feet on the ground and approach it and let's, let's get something done in these situations. Um, I will tell you, I can tell you some stories though um, share with you, so these are many, many years ago, it's one of the most interesting ones. And just like Freud used to give his patients names, he called like rap person and things like this, we started giving some of our employee cases names. But the one that comes to mind is Boo Boo Virgie. And Virgie, Virginia, actually had convinced herself that all of her co-workers were conspiring against her. And I said, Boo, how do you revert you in you? How do you know this? And she said that they had conscripted the Jamaican cleaning woman to practice voodoo and sprinkle her chair with some substance. And I, I, the other thing about Virginia was this actually truly exists that somebody mentioned bipolar, and I don't know how you diagnose this, but she had two different, completely different personalities. When she was bad virgin, she was very, very bad and used some rather tough language around the office and threatening language, but when she was good virgin, and I had her at hearings testify, she was the most I, how can I say, elegant woman and presenter that I have ever put on the stand. And she could switch incredibly. I said, this is simply amazing. She, she could transfer herself. When she got back in the office, she got bad. When she needed to be good, she was just perfect. But anyhow, let's jump in. I always like to be eclectic here. Um, yeah, we, we uh, actually I wanted to mention a complex, the co we are a college of complexes, there's a repressed desire to need to express something. And you're out of time. You know? Oh, all right, I got to get moving here. I will tell you, I like to think about the five monkey studies. I, I, got, I can give you a whole bunch more. I got 25 monkey studies. I did have to, and last of all, this church stuff. Going to church is about the last thing you want to do. Baloney! <laughs> Stay away from it. Oh, these are the guys that say, oh, if something's wrong with you, you're possessed by a demon. We're, we're going to do some cathartic dances and they'll disappear. And also, the other that be cautious with churches because if you ever go to one, don't let them, don't look them in the eye because I'll try to hypnotize you <laughs> to get you to join. Anyhow, thank you very much. Any other presenters? Yeah, you got hypnotized. <laughs> if there's no other presenter, speaker gets the list. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Let's get our speakers in. Thank you for this presentation. It was fantastic. And my wife is not saying she is nice. Hey, <laughs> What about our speaker? Have, uh, what about, about our speaker? Uh, Is there time for our speaker? Yeah, I, know. I, I want to take 30 okay. seconds though so before we do uh, it. I want to give a special round of recognition tonight. We've been at the hilltop for over about a year now. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Chris thank you. for the accommodations and all of the work that he's done to make that back room better and to make our society and our club comfortable here at the restaurant. Yay! So Chris and his staff, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love you guys.
take the last word. Okay. 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 The last word. Last word. Last word. Last word. Last word. Uh, last word very, very brief. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, there's something in what I said that can be taken away and used to uh, your benefit. And, and again, as I said earlier, uh, feel free to pass on the knowledge, the information to anybody. I mean, uh, uh, and people can, you know, again, look at these things in many different ways. There are 400, 500 schools of psychology, therapy, etc. It's always been there. But at the end of the day, when you boil it down, there's certain things that will be uniform through all of it. And some of what I talked about today is, is part of that. Uh, and again, th thank you all very much.